Hello students, Professor Watts here. Welcome to lecture one for my uh, newly revamped and improved online Econ 201. So we're going to start off at the very beginning by just talking about how we know what we know in economics. So let's start by defining economics. What is economics? Well, the word itself, oikonomia, there it is in Greek, and how we would spell it in English, uh, literally means the management of a household, or the rule, the governing of a household. It's about how we manage our work and our lives so as we can achieve the best possible results, right? And in today's economic jargon, we might use terms like efficiency or optimizing the production and use of goods and services. In the ancient world, that was mostly located inside of the household. So managing your house meant making sure everybody was doing their part to uh, produce goods and services to sustain everybody's lives and maybe bring about some kind of quality of life. It's useful to uh, to take a glimpse at the ancient Greeks because they were you know highly civilized in ancient times and highly uh, developed, of course, in their language and their philosophy and uh, music and art. So they have they left us a lot of art in ancient Greeks depicting these concepts of household management, people working, producing, right? And they wanted to maximize that because as you already know, and as we'll explore in more detail, we live in a world of scarcity. We always want more. There's never quite enough goods and resources to satisfy every possible thing we could want to do with them. I found a few pictures of uh, Greek pottery that's very well preserved that depicts that household management of producing goods and services. Here you can see one of um, some people weaving, making cloth by hand was uh, very uh, important back then. Here's one depicting uh, women carrying their water jars to a uh, fountain to fill the water jars, of course carry them home so everybody could have water. Here's one that uh, is a pot that depicts people making pots, which I found kind of amusing. It reminds me of a funny scene from one of the Austin Powers movies. And a factory in Chicago that makes miniature models of factories. So this concept, of course, is ancient. Economics is nothing new. It's, it's existed as long as people have existed and, and needed to think and work in order to live. Now, let's move on to a kind of a more formal or modern uh, definition. And a, a very basic one that I like to start with is the study of decision-making under scarcity. How do we know what to do with our lives, with our time, with our resources, given that we don't have enough of anything. And this applies to both people on an individual basis and also then in society. And we're going to really focus on the societal aspect of this because uh, on our own, we can hardly achieve anything. But in society, working with other people, we can achieve a lot. So um, a broader definition is this concept of how we can benefit from interacting with other people in a society, in an economy, in a country or an international order of exchange, trade, business, commerce, and so on. Okay, so there's a, there's a very brief glimpse into what economics is. We'll unpack that a lot going forward, but I want to spend the rest of today's lecture focusing on this concept of science. So I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what is and is not science. So let's, uh, let's break it down. Science comes from the Latin word scientia, which simply means knowledge. So science is just knowledge. Okay, It can refer to a body of knowledge about some area that we're interested in. You know, botany is the names and properties of, different, of plant life. Physics is how physical objects uh, interact with each other. You know, we have the laws of gravity, for example. We can move on from that to talk about the concept of science as a pursuit of new knowledge. How do we go about developing knowledge, building knowledge, testing knowledge, and make sure what we think we know is actually true and correct? Right? And if you think about the scientific method, which I'll comment on a little bit more, um, that's, this is probably what most people think about when they think of, quote, science. And that's true, of course, but that's only part of what science is, broadly speaking. Okay? And finally, there's the concept of applying that knowledge, wherever it came from, towards human pursuits. The science of management, that's something we teach about in business school. 
and how to run a business better, more efficiently, more effectively, more profitably. All right, so science is a broad concept. It's not just people in lab coats with microscopes or computer models. You know, it's not just nerds uh, analyzing data or running experiments. It's for all of us. Now, I say this because I think there's uh, kind of a mentality out there in our time where people have too narrow of a view of science. And I'm encouraging us to take on a broader view and a more holistic view. And I think the attitude towards science these days is captured by a character from a, uh, one of my favorite movies. I don't know why you always have to be judging me because I only believe in science. Now, when Escalito there says he only believes in science, um, I guess he's referring to more of that idea of the scientific method as the only way to uh, acquire knowledge. And of course, that's in contrast to the, to the very devout and religious minded Nacho. But I want to emphasize here that there's much more to science than just the, the idea of the scientific method and you know doing science in the sense of experts in laboratories. So the main focus today is I want to talk about there's two ways of knowing and how we apply these to, to our developing the science of economics, the knowledge of economics. So empirical knowledge, and this is probably what Escalito has in mind when he talks about he only believes in science is one and it's kind of the big one and it's maybe the dominant one in in most realms that are labeled quote science again i'll, I'll kind of break down the word so we can understand it it comes uh, ultimately from greek via latin and it means experience or experiment so empirical knowledge involves collecting data or making systematic observations and then running some kind of test or experiment with that data to see if a particular idea about the relationship of various objects in the world is true. Of course, and we know that in the form of the scientific method. You develop a hypothesis, you collect data, and you set up some kind of uh, experiment or test to, to see if your hypothesis works or, or doesn't. Now, importantly here, we want, I want to note this concept of falsifiability in the scientific method. Ultimately, what scientists are doing under this method is seeing if the data leads to the rejection of the hypothesis or not. They are not verifying the hypothesis per se, right? You can only falsify a hypothesis. You cannot definitively verify or prove something true. And the reason why is that a hypothesis that might be labeled as an accepted hypothesis is always subject to falsification at some point in the future, if new data come along, new experience, new observations come, come to light, that when the hypothesis is tested again, will lead us ultimately to drop that hypothesis. So there's uh, many examples of this historically. There was the idea of phrenology, where you could study kind of the shape of a person's head and determine their intelligence or character, you know, some kind of immutable characteristics of a person. Now, of course, that's been debunked, and how is that debunked? That was debunked by further advances in science, which falsified the, the phrenological hypotheses. So, this is okay, empirical science, what most people think about when we talk about science, quote. But let me introduce you to another form of knowing, another form of science, if you will, that a lot of people are unfamiliar with, but it's actually very basic. And it's very, uh, in a sense, it's very easy to do, or I should say it's, it comes very naturally. And this is a priori, okay? Now, I'll break the word down again. A priori, you can probably kind of guess it to what that means because you can see the English word prior within that word. And what does prior mean? It means beforehand, right? And this is a Latin word that literally means from before. Well, from before what? Before testing or before making some kind of systematic observation or experiment, we already know certain things. We don't need to collect evidence to prove that they're true or to, or to establish an accepted hypothesis, to be precise. Okay. And I'll give us some examples here in a minute, but let me comment on the source of a priori knowledge is just the fact that we are human beings and what makes humans unique and special is that we're rational we're reasoning. We have the capacity for thought. And that gives us special access to certain kinds of knowledge, specifically knowledge about humanity and our situation in the world. 
right? So just using our noggins, we can develop a lot of knowledge. Here's some examples, right? I know that as a human, I have wants and needs, right? I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. So I can intuit that that is going to be true of all human beings. Everybody's going to have hunger and thirst. Now, we might have different tastes about what kind of food is going to best satisfy our hunger, but we all have a basic hunger because that's uh, needed to survive. And the, the whole idea of that we want to survive, generally speaking, self-preservation. Okay. We move into economics per se, we can talk about the logic of trade. Right? The fact that I know I can uh, better my situation by trading away things I don't want as much for things that somebody else has, that'll make me happier, right? And we probably all experience this at a very early age. I uh, fondly remember myself trading certain items in my lunch, in the lunchroom at school, for items with other people, right? I'll trade you my pickles for your Doritos, for example. Right? Well, here's the big picture. A priori, we know that people are rational, and therefore we can infer from that that people respond to incentives in predictable ways. Now, there will be some exceptions to this, but I'll suggest, and we'll, we'll go over this ground in more detail in, in a later lecture, that the exceptions are so minimal as to not really be important. But I will mention, this is not technically always true, but it's so generally true that it's a very firm foundation for where we're going to go in, in econ. Okay. We respond to incentives in predictable ways. And then we can start thinking about, well, how do we structure those incentives, those rewards and penalties that motivate people to do things maybe we want them to do and to avoid doing things that we don't want them to do. And that's how society is built. It's built on incentives. It's built on rationality. We don't need to prove these things. Look inside ourselves. We know this already. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. Okay, so start wrapping up here. I have just a couple more questions I want to pursue. First off, is economics a science? Absolutely yes. Right? Why? Because we are discovering and applying knowledge. Knowledge about people, the situation we all face, and principles that underlie how we interact with other people to achieve the goals we're trying to achieve. Now, Remember, there's two ways of knowing, a priori and empirical. Economics is fundamentally and always a priori. It's based on some fundamental realities that we already know just because we are rational human beings. Three of these principles are basically the foundation of economic knowledge or economic science, and I'm going to expound upon these in, in much more detail uh, in, in another lecture upcoming. We face scarcity. We are rational and self-interested. So that's kind of where we're going next here. Now, economics can be empirical, but doesn't have to be. And you can actually get a lot of use out of economics without doing any empirics at all. Any observation, data, collection, testing of hypothesis, statistics, etc. Experiments. Okay. Well, I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, we can do observational studies that reveal the magnitude of incentive effects based on different rules, different incentive schemes. Businesses can use patterns of consumer behavior that are established empirically to guide decisions like what product should I make, what, what price should I charge, you know, what kind of marketing will be most effective, and so on. And a lot of that applied economics is really what we're teaching and studying in business school. Management and marketing really all integrate that kind of applied economics at a fundamental level. That's why all business students have to take econ. Right, and then we can look at historical data to reveal the specific impacts of various government policies. I'll show you an example of that here in just a second. Is econ useful? Absolutely, yes. It's useful for you personally, it's useful for businesses, it's useful for an entire country or civilization. Okay. Applying both a priori, and then it will do a maybe a little bit of empirical economics. In this class, we'll start to learn how we can apply economics in a very beneficial and very useful way. Okay. As individuals, it'll help us analyze the decisions we have to make on a daily basis, make more effective decisions, become more productive. And then also, 
become more aware of other the people around us what do they want and need and what can they do to help us in a business level entrepreneurs people who run business you want to make more money minimize the waste of time and resources be more effective well knowing some economics is very useful in that regard I'll give you some personal examples of that because I have several small business enterprises that I've been involved with and finally as citizens in society we want to implement good policies that work out to the mutual benefit of, of everybody, our, our fellow man, our fellow citizen, and avoid bad ones that, um, that would maybe move us backwards in terms of concepts like quality of life or standard of living, social harmony. And those are worked out ultimately through a political process. So economics really informs, or we should want it to inform, the decisions we have to make collectively, societally, through our political system, through our government. Let me close by giving you a quick example of that um, that third category and how particular policies affect people's incentives. So on an a priori basis, we can predict that paying people for being unemployed will lead to more people choosing to be unemployed or maybe more likely remain unemployed. Right? People often become unemployed through no choice of their own. They get fired or laid off. Right? But how hard do you work to find a new job? Well, that depends on the incentives you face. Okay? Unemployment insurance is meant to help people uh, deal with the financial hardship of being unemployed. However, we know that if you give people too much help, it's going to ratchet down their incentive to go find a new job. Okay? And empirically, whenever there's changes made in the unemployment benefit program, we can look at that historical data and assess the magnitude of this incentive effect. Okay? We gave people some more or less unemployment assistance at a particular point in time, and then we can study what happened. And here's an example of that empirical economics. Um, this is one of my favorite examples because it, there was a large number of studies that all came to basically the same conclusion. The their estimates of the exact magnitude are varied, but they centered around a positive number. So this is a blog post from an, an econ blog I, I often read from uh, 2012, and it was looking back on 2009 after the, what was called the Great Recession, and unemployment benefits were expanded up to, from, they, they would typically have, would have been something like 26 weeks worth of unemployment payments expanded first to 50 and then up to 99 weeks. And what did that do to the unemployment rate? Well, it raised it about 1%. And if you want, you can pause and read kind of the summaries of different studies here. There was a slew of studies, and they all came to largely the same conclusion. They had different point estimates of the exact effect. But that's just an example. Okay, that's what empirical economics can do. And that helps us um, going forward because, you know, during policy discussions of should we raise unemployment benefits, we want to think, well, okay, on the one hand, yeah, it'd be nice if we have a big unemployment crisis to help people more. But on the other hand, if you give people too much unemployment or for too long of a period of time, you might disincentivize them from trying to go back to, to work and that will hurt the economy over the longer term, right? So which course of action should we take? Well, I can't tell you, but I can tell you how to, how, how to analyze the, the question, right? So we're gonna combine that a, a priori source of knowing with the empirical source of knowing and use economics to live better lives, make better decisions, be more wise. So I'm really looking forward to unpacking some of these concepts further as we go forward and helping all of you learn how to think like an economist. See you next time.